And so let's get started this morning. We've come to the last message in the series of Jonah, uh, and I've been praying diligently, diligently that the Holy Spirit has applied the word to your lives. And the last few weeks, we've been studying this historical narrative, uh, a story, but a real story, a real historical narrative, the story of Jonah, who, as I've been saying, is God's prodigal prophet. Uh, and I've done my best to paint the picture, to paint the picture of the storyline that began with God calling Jonah to preach to the Ninevites, to lost people. We notice quickly how uh, things went uh, on a downward spiral due to Jonah's disobedience and that he fled the opposite direction where God called him to. And we, we noticed how uh, uh, things didn't go well for Jonah, how God sent a vicious storm, a storm that should have, could have, would have killed Jonah. Uh, but this storm actually revealed to us that God is a relentless pursuer of both saints and sinners, either pursuing us for salvation or pursuing us for discipline. God is a relentless pursuer of people, and he, he pursues people because I believe God wants revival, that God is willing to revive, because God is a God who is, loves to bring life out of death. And so we saw that story and how God's mercy and how God's grace and how his sovereignty has worked throughout this entire book of Jonah, God's mercy, God's sovereignty, and God's grace being the main themes of this book. And so last week, we uh, should have noticed that, once again, God is still in the business of revival and how God was willing to revive a wicked nation like Nineveh, but also understanding that like Nineveh, our nation, our communities, our country, our world is in desperate need of revival. And so this storyline began at a low point with Jonah's disobedience, and the ark was fairly dramatic. Uh, but this morning, once again, after looking at revival last week, we're going to see how the storyline this week reaches to the lowest of all lows. Because now we get to see exactly what was going on inside of Jonah's heart. We had hints of it, we could predict it, but now we see what was happening in Jonah's heart. And to tell you the truth, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. Um, and so let's turn our Bibles to Jonah chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 1 through 11. When you have it, if you can stand for the reading of the word, Jonah 4, 1 through 11, the word of the Lord says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God, a merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord appointed a plan and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry, angry enough to, to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 
120,000 persons who did not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you just so thankful for this beautiful morning, this opportunity to gather as a church family, uh, to hear your word, to, to worship your, your son. Father, I ask that this word would sink down into our heart this morning. Um, Father, I pray that our hearts would be softened to receive your word. I pray that uh, your word would go out with a purpose that it wouldn't return void. I pray that your word uh, be a mirror to us that helps us to see any imperfections, any blemishes in our heart this morning. I pray that then we would submit to your word. Father, help me to decrease that you may increase, have your way, soften hearts, strengthen hearts, change hearts, whatever needs to happen, make it happen in Christ's name. Amen. May be seated. Well, in 2005, the well-known actor Adam Sandler starred in an overall clean and decent movie called The 50, 51st Dates, where Adam Sandler's character, after years of meaningless dating, fell in love with a young woman by the name of Lucy. The arc of the movie included Lucy and Adam Sandler's hopeless story of romance, where the sweet, uh, where the sweet uh, Lucy uh, captured Sandler's heart as they pranced around the island of Hawaii, and it all seemed like a beautiful, perfect love story, but to come to find out, Lucy's friends and family happened to be hiding a huge secret from Sandler's character, the secret that provided the tension in the movie, because you know there always has to be tension in a love story. Uh, but they had been uh, hiding, a, uh, hiding uh, having a secret that they were hiding, and uh, come to find out, Lucy had been in an accident prior, years prior that caused her to have memory issues where she would forget the day's events as she went to sleep at night, no matter how wonderful the day happened to be. The heartwarming movie cycled through comedy and emotional scenes where Adam Sandler learned how to win Lucy's love and affection over again on the daily basis. And evidently, Adam Sandler's I uh, love Lucy so much that uh, it was well worth it to him to do that. Uh, I'm probably butchering the story a little bit. Uh, I've seen it once, uh, but after some tense moments of despair, Adam Sandler found that if uh, he still had a chance to live happily ever after, if he would just play this certain song that jarred... Uh, Maddie, you know the story better than me. It looks like you're smiling. <laughs> but this song jarred her memory and gave her some memory retention. Long story short... Uh, this learned memory retention sped up the process, and as soon as Sandler's character played that song, All Was Well, it was a really cute movie. Uh, I'm sure many wives will now force their husbands to watch it. Sorry, men, you can thank me later. Um, it was a heartwarming tale, and like I said, fairly clean. But what Lucy was suffering from was a condition called amnesia, uh, specifically anterograde amnesia, that type of amnesia being defined as a condition that greatly affects a person's memory, their ability to hold on to memories of even the recent past, including facts and new information and experiences. Uh, this is, might have been a fictional movie, but it's a real condition, this type of amnesia that real people suffer from. But as I was thinking through the story of Jonah, I've come to realize that Lucy was, is not the only one who suffers from amnesia. I can't personally witness to this fact, but I'm told that husbands also suffer from a form of what's called selective amnesia, uh, where we forget to uh, complete tasks around the house that we secretly don't want to do, and so we develop this selective amnesia. I don't know personally about any of that, but I heard uh, I know two-year-olds definitely suffer from selective amnesia when the reward is not proper or after it's consumed. I heard a rumor that teenagers suffer from this sometimes. It's a, it's a it's serious problem. It's a worldwide pandemic that needs to be addressed. But this morning, as we end this series, I want to look at another form of amnesia that is not defined on WebMD's website. 
this type of amnesia, this type of forgetfulness, this type of amnesia that I'm referring to this morning as we dissect the last chapter of this wonderful book is what I refer to as spiritual amnesia. Spiritual amnesia, the type of amnesia that especially reveals itself through how we often forget that God is God and that because God is God, God has the right to guide our path, to tell us what to do. Spiritual amnesia, the type of amnesia that causes us at times to forget that life is not all about us, that God, in fact, is the one who is sitting on the potter's wheel with the authority to mold us into what he wishes to mold us into, spiritual amnesia, the type of amnesia that causes us uh, sometimes to forget about the grace of God, to forget about the mercy of God that he continues to pour out in our life. Sometimes we get this spiritual amnesia, the type of amnesia that even at times causes us as Christians to act like unredeemed sinners instead of sanctified saints. Brothers and sisters, I'm putting it mildly, but Jonah, this prodigal prophet in the text today, is suffering, suffering from an extreme case of spiritual amnesia where he has conveniently and rebelliously failed to remember a few truths, three of which we'll look at this morning in an attempt to keep us from following Jonah's example, with the first being this morning, point number one, that Jonah, suffering from this spiritual amnesia, point number one, has forgot his mission. Has forgot his mission. Jonah has forgot his mission. How do I know that Jonah forgot his mission? I know Jonah forgot his mission because at the end of chapter three, we see a miracle of souls being saved, which causes even the angels in heaven to break out in a praise song. This was a miracle of salvation and where where a, a, a wicked city turned into a redeemed city. But the problem is, as we turn to chapter four, we don't see the celebration in Jonah. We don't see the, the, the uh, participation in, in singing the praises of God along with the choirs in heaven. How do I know that Jonah forgot his mission? Well, I know Jonah forgot his mission because as a missionary, as a prophet of God, Jonah should have been absolutely ecstatic that he was chosen to play a part in quite literally one of the greatest revivals in human history where everyone from the greatest to the least of the Ninevites came to faith in God. Yet verse 1 tells us that while revival broke out in the city of Nineveh, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Look at the contrast of, of chapters, end of chapter 3 to the beginning of chapter 4. Thousands and thousands of people were saved, but as we turn to chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and we are told that he was angry. Now, as a missionary, as a prophet, Jonah should have been praising God. As a believer in the Most High God, Jonah should have been celebrating with his new brothers and sisters that have now entered into the flock of God. Jonah should have slaughtered the fattest calf and celebrated with a feast. As a missionary, he should have been considering how he could equip and organize and train up the Ninevites to then go march into neighboring countries, armed not with the sword to kill people, but with the sword of the Spirit, armed with the message of God's forgiveness. Jonah should have been equipping them. Jonah should have been eager to disciple these new believers. He should have been focused on preparing them to remain faithful to to God to, by teaching them the character of God who they are now in a covenant relationship with. However, when we look at the language of this text, instead of this uh, uh, overflowing with joy, the Bible says Jonah was displeased. The word displeased is actually more powerful than we think it is. The word displeased means that Jonah, in fact, went into a violent rage, a fit of anger, a fit of anger directed at God and what God did. Now, some say the lowest point in this story of Jonah was when he was in the belly of the fish, but I believe this is actually the lowest point in Jonah's story because while the physical circumstances of being in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights was unbearable and horrible, that, that was nothing compared to the spiritual darkness that 
we see being revealed in the Jonah's heart, evidenced by his reaction to this great revival. Emily, isn't it sad to see that when that God, when God saw what Nineveh did, how they humbled himself, how they re- themselves, how they repented of sin, how they turned from their wicked ways, God responded by relenting from his anger. But when Jonah saw what God did, he went into a fit of anger. Think about it. God is the only one who can justly and rightly truly judge sin. And, and he was slow to anger in his dealings with Jonah, the sailors that we looked at a couple weeks ago, and the entire city of Nineveh. But a mere human was immediately angry at God for saving an entire city. Jonah was so angry, so out of control, that he even prayed an angry prayer to God. Now, I've never really done this, I don't think. I mean, uh, uh, think how crazy this is. He prayed an angry prayer at God for saving people. He said, oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? He said, this is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. Therefore now, Lord, please take my life, for it is better for me to live than to die. Family, look at this, this spiritual amnesia, this infantile regression of this prodigal prophet whose life was in a spiritual vice where he kept pressing towards back on God and God kept pressing back on Jonah. It's a remarkable picture that someone could actually be angry at God for saving people, yet this is where Jonah was at. This is a remarkable few verses because it exposes so much of the potential for darkness that could remain even inside the heart of a Christian. If we don't continually, by the mercies of God, present our bodies, our lives as spiritual sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God as an act of worship. Family, this is what happens when the believers conform to the wicked pattern of the word instead of making sure that we are washed with the word of God and transformed in our mind so that we will be able to discern what is good, acceptable, and perfect brothers and sisters. Let's look at Jonah here for a minute and recognize the spiritual darkness in his heart. But then let's look at ourselves and ask if we have any spiritual amnesia that causes us to forget our mission. Let's look at ourselves and see if we mourn when we should be celebrating and if we celebrate when we should be mourning. Let's look at ourselves and see if we do what Jonah did when he tried even to manipulate God using his own words. Jonah said, I knew you are a gracious God, a merciful God that's slow to anger, that loves people and and is willing to forgive. But the thing is, Jonah said, look, I don't care what God wants. I don't like it. I want those people to get what they deserve. That's darkness. As if we Christians haven't been sent on a mission. As if we Christians have been sent on a mission to ignore and hope for destruction. Instead of being on a mission to seek and save the lost. Family Jonah has a wicked case of spiritual amnesia causing him to forget his mission. The crazy thing about this spiritual amnesia that caused him to forget his mission is that Jonah was actually a very passionate servant of God when it came to his own people. Jonah took a lot of pride in being from the nation of Israel, but Jonah forgot why the nation of Israel was chosen in the first place. For Israel wasn't chosen because they were the biggest country with the strongest military. Israel wasn't chosen so they could be puffed up with pride and arrogance as if they were some type of spiritual elite people separated from all of creation. No, Israel, uh, Jonah's own nation, Jonah's own people that he was a prophet from uh, was uh, able to experience God's grace and God's mercy and God's love and all that came with that. Why? So they could be a mission. They can be on mission and witnessing to who God is. Israel's mission wasn't to hoard God's blessings. Their God-given privileges of, of receiving the covenants, the law, the sacrificial system that points towards Christ. Uh, they were blessed to be a blessing. 
Jonah was blessed to be a blessing. They were expected to extend the revelation of who God is to all the nation, to all the nations. They had forgot their mission. Jonah forgot his mission about the country that he was so proud of being in. In fact, the mission that God gave the Israelites, according to Exodus 19, was for the nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of priests, of individual priests called to represent the nations before God, to be agents of reconciliation that shared God's plan of redemption, God's plan to save sinners and bring them back into a, giving, a life-giving relationship with God. Jonah, though, forgot his mission. He forgot his nation's mission. He forgot his personal mission, and he had no compassion for the nations. He looked at neighboring countries as, as not as potential brothers and sisters— potential recipients of God's grace and mercy and restoration, but Jonah looked at everyone else as recipients of God's wrath. He was not interested in their deliverance, but their destruction, even to the point where God directly looked at him and asked him, do you do well to be angry? God was saying, man, man, how how could you be angry? Is that the right response? And even that question didn't shake Jonah out of his spiritual amnesia for he, for you guys are making me into a superstar apparently. Did the lights go out? Am I just, okay, okay, okay. Well, all lights on me, that's okay. But God said, man, is that the right response to be like that? We know it's not. A family, I plead with you this morning as we take our eyes off Jonah and put it on ourselves for a second. As a member of just a Bible fellowship, as an individual Christian, I encourage you to never forget your mission. To never forget that our mission is to seek and save the lost. Never forget our mission is the great commission that calls us, that demands us to go out and share the gospel, to teach the gospel. Never forget that our specific mission as a church, as a, a calling that our church is under, is to go out and to, to look for people who are discouraged and bring them into a joyous fellowship with God. Never forget that our mission is never about us. It's never about our wants, our desires, our preferences. Uh, uh, the mission is never about what glorifies man or, uh, or lifts man up on high, but only uh, what li- that lifts God up on high, that glorify God's family. We can never, never, never look at me, look at me. We can never forget that we are chosen by God. For what reason? For the reason of being ministers of reconciliation, ambassadors for Jesus Christ, clean and honorable vessels set apart and useful to the master, master prepared for every good work. Family, the second we forget our mission, the devil will sneak into our fellowship, pounce on us, and create all types of division. Therefore... Unlike Jonah, we need to be alert and sober-minded at all times, making sure that we don't fall into these heart patterns of not loving people that Jonah has displayed this past few weeks. For if we forget our mission, you can be assured that God, that, that Satan will take the opportunity to steal and kill and destroy Jonah forgot his mission. His spiritual amnesia caused him for, to forget his mission. Let us never forget our mission. Amen? Amen? Then number two, Jonah, suffering from this great spiritual amnesia, tragically then forgot his own personal need for grace. Look at verse 5. It says, Jonah went out of the city and he sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade. Tell you should see what would become of the city. Picture it. A great revival happened. Jonah was incredibly displeased. He went out uh, from the city, who knows, maybe a couple miles, and he made a shelter in the hot sun, and, and he popped, popped some popcorn and said, uh, oh, I want to see what happens. Not hoping that, that the, the revival would continue, but hoping that God's grace would not be there and only his wrath. That is, that is 
That is evil, my friends. Even though God's grace had been poured out to Jonah in the form of a storm, discipling for him or disciplining him for his rebellion, that God's grace had been poured out him in the, uh, on him in the form of a fish saving his life, God's grace had continually been poured out on Jonah. We see now that even though God's grace continues to be poured out on Jonah in the form of God delivering him from the hot sun in the form of a, a plant that grew up real fast, Jonah is still intent on forgetting his need for grace while, while hoping others receive God's wrath. I just have to keep saying it. This is a very wicked and evil heart issue. This is Jonah operating in extreme darkness instead of walking in the light of the Lord. Uh, uh, Jonah forgot his own personal need for God's unmerited grace. And so the Lord responded with an object lesson aimed at teaching Jonah about his continual need for grace. For once again, just as God appointed or assigned the great fish to swallow Jonah, the Lord now appoints or assigned a plant to miraculously grow fast in order to deliver Jonah from the unbearable sun that was beating down on him. Family, just look at the amazing grace of God. Look at the extreme patience of God. Picture the scene. Jonah put together a, a weak shelter so he could look towards the city to see if God would, would relent of his relenting and actually wipe out Nineveh. Yet God, seeing that Jonah was roasting in the sun, is still, still full of grace that he provided Jonah comfort from this heat. This object lesson, though, is really not about Jonah's comfort, for God is teaching Jonah and us about the need for grace. God does this in the text here through a play on words, through a play on words connected with chapter 3, verse 10, and with chapter 4, verse 6, when the Bible tells us that both the Ninevites were rescued from disaster and Jonah was rescued from discomfort. Pay attention to this. This is actually pretty cool. But if uh, you do a study of those two words, disaster in 3 verse 10, that the Ninevites were rescued from, and the word discomfort in chapter 4 verse 6, that Jonah was rescued from, you will see that both of those words are actually the same words in the Hebrew language. So what the Lord did to expose Jonah's hypocrisy and remind him of his personal and consistent personal need of God's grace is God withdrew his grace in the form of the shade he provided by then once again appointing or assigning a worm to destroy the plant. In other words, Jonah received the same grace that the Ninevites did, but when God takes it away, Jonah responds in an opposite way. After the assigned worm destroyed the assigned plant, God then waited till the morning and let it get real hot until Jonah was about to pass out just to show him that he needs to stop playing games with God. Brothers and sisters, as a side point, we need to remember not to play games with God, to Avoid taking the grace of God for granted. And this is what God did. God removed his grace. And all of the sudden, Jonah did what? He wanted to die again. We need to remember, family, that the only reason we have breath in our lungs, the only reason that we have a roof over our head, the only reason we woke up this morning is because God chooses to give us undeserved grace instead of his rightful judgment. At this point, we would finally expect Jonah to get it, to remember his need for grace and say, wow, I was a little displeased because you, you, you took away my shelter. Maybe I should uh, humble myself and realize that, you know, a plant being destroyed is really not as bad as 120,000 people dying. Yet for some reason, Jonah was not pleased. He was still not pleased and he asked to die. 
The irony in this story is at all time high because earlier, Jonah, in his intense anger towards God, wanted to die rather than to see sinners live and be delivered from pending disaster. But now he wants to die because of his intense anger at God for not continuing to deliver him from the disaster that he caused himself. For God did not tell Jonah to go outside the city and hope for this nation to be crushed. But somehow, some way, Jonah thinks he deserves God's blessings, but other people deserve God's wrath. Somehow, some way, Jonah, even though he should have been killed by the storm, the sea, the fish, and the sun, is still filled with self-righteousness, declaring himself to be uh, 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 deserving of God's favor, while declaring Nineveh to be deserving of God's punishment. Somehow, some way, being so filled with pride, Jonah believes that he is righteous and everyone else that's not from his country is a lawbreaker. Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit is saying, no, 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 not one is righteous, that no one understands, that no one seeks for God, that for, for God, that all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. There is no distinction for what last I heard, all have sinned and turned away from God and fallen short of his glory. And if you are saved, if you are justified, it is only because of the kindness of God and not because you deserve it. Ah, brothers and sisters, let's get rid of this spiritual amnesia that causes us to forget that if it wasn't for grace, we wouldn't be standing here today. If it wasn't for God's grace, we would all still be lost and not found. We would all still be blind, not able to see, recognizing our own drastic need for grace will stop us from being hypocritical, will stop us from being legalist, will stop us from being unloving to people while we soak in the blessings of God, sitting back and hoping that they get what they deserve. We must remember our need for grace. And then number three, this morning, let us never forget that it could have been us. Now, this is a phrase that I repeat often, but let me break this down for you. The circumstances that led to me turning to Jesus, at least in my, opi- my opinion, was a drastic situation where at the age of 19, I was making some decisions that should have ruined my life completely. Now, my life flashed before my very eyes in a variety of ways, and each time within a few months that I continued disobeying God, continued making these decisions, I finally noticed that God protected me, and eventually God's protection and love for me and grace for me led me to my knees. I was so thankful that God had delivered me from the consequences of my sin. I really didn't understand too much about the eternal consequences of my sin. But at the age of 19, I was so grateful that what could have happened to me didn't happen, that what should have happened to me didn't happen, that what, what, what I deserve actually didn't happen. And, and no, I'm not going to tell you what my personal sin was. That's between me and God, as authentic as we all want to be. We never tell it all, do we? It was something drastic. Life was flashing before my eyes, and I finally gave my life to Christ. And I remember telling God that night I was saved, that I was so thankful for what he's done for me that I will do whatever he asked me to do for the rest of my life. Now, it's interesting. That was actually a check that I couldn't cash because I still fail God all the time. But in a very soft yet powerful moment, I heard the Holy Spirit whispering to me, not in an audible voice, not in some type of weird revelation, but I just, I just heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. And, and I remember it sounded like this, where God was saying, okay, I saved you, and I'm going to take you on a long journey, but never forget, never forget that it could have been you. What that whisper meant 
to me is at all times and in every way, God was telling me that I must stay humble and be full of grace for other people because some people suffered from the consequences that I too deserved. The whisper of, it could have been me, actually is what led me to uh, uh, my entire adult, adult life of ministering to people. That, that, that phrase, it could have been me, it could have been you, is what actually gave me a soft, soft heart to serve people in my 20s who were addicted to drugs and alcohol and ho- homelessness and, and where just lives were wrecked. Why? Because I remember that it could have been me that was addicted to whatever, that, 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 that should have been in jail, could have been in jail. I remember that it could have been me, and now I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because I remember that it could have been me, that I could have been left to myself, that, I, that, that, that God didn't have to reach me on that Friday night when I was 20 years old and saved my life. Family, we've got to remember that it could have been me. It could have been me that suffered in a way that other people suffered. And now, while I'm obviously very not perfect at this at all, every time I go through a season where I get frustrated with people, even uh, every time I'm tempted to focus on the speck in someone else's eye without, you know, removing the log in my own eye, that rings true in my life over and over again, that it could have been me. Remembering that it could have been us helps us to live with grace. And this is what Jonah forgot about. He forgot that his own sin should have been punished immediately. He forgot that he could have been the one who was born not in Israel, but in a dysfunctional family in the city of Nineveh, surrounded by evil, by violence and destruction. He forgot that it could have been him. He forgot that, that the reason why maybe the Ninevites behaved the way they behaved is because they knew no different. That they were, many of them probably were just trying to survive. And, and for some of them, evil and violence is all they knew. Jonah forgot that it could have been him born into those circumstances. He forgot that, that, that some families and some people are just, just so inundated with sinful lifestyles that they don't even know what it means to live a God-honoring lifestyle. And what I'm not doing is I'm not making excuses for sin, but we have to understand that some people are just in a different environment. And this is what he forgot about Nineveh. He for, forgot that he have easily could have been born there. He forgot that it could have been him. Sometimes we forget that it could have been us. Now think about it, if I didn't have certain people in my life that shared the gospel with me, that showed me a different way, it too would have been me. If we were not born with godly parents and 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 uh, a, a church to come to to receive the word of God and the, have a covering of spiritual godly parents and all that, then we might just have some issues too, wouldn't we? This is what Jonah forgot to the point where God responded by saying, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in, in, in a night and perished in a night. You cared about this old, old plant, but I shouldn't care about Nineveh, the great city where there are more than 120,000 people that will die without my grace. But that's what you care about. You don't care that it could have been you. All you care is about that your plant died. That's wicked. And so the text leaves us with a cliffhanger. Because we don't get to hear Jonah's response. We don't know if Jonah said, oh God, you're right. Something tells me that maybe that's not what he said. But we get to see his spiritual amnesia, his forgetting his mission. We get to see the comprehensive need for grace. 
His forgetting that it could have been him, but we don't get to see his answer of why should I not pity Nineveh? Basically, why should I not save people and not a plan? But we don't get to see this answer because in the end, this story is really not about Jonah. The story is really a mirror to cause us to examine ourselves and ask ourselves if we love God enough to then go out and love people. We don't get to hear Jonah's response because in the end it's not about Jonah. The question is really for each of us in, as individual Christians to answer. We don't get to hear Jonah's answer because this is a challenge, a challenge for us to make a commitment to love God enough to then go out and share that love of Christ with all people, not just the people that we're naturally drawn to. For we are called to love impartially, not just in thought but in action. And so here is the application for the entire book of Jonah. Here's the application. I invite you as applying this this, this text, this book to yourself, I invite you, family, to do what you can do to clear out anything in your heart that doesn't flow from a heart of impartial love for people. For in chapter 4, we finally see why Jonah ran from God. We finally see why he rebelled from God. We finally see why Jonah behaved the way that he did and why he went out uh, of the city and was sitting down and waiting for it to burn. Jonah behaved this way because point blank, he had hate in his heart for people. He was partial in his love. He only loved people that looked the way he looked. He only loved the people that acted the way he acted. He only loved people that was just like him. His hate had blinded him so much that he was wholeheartedly willing to do whatever he had to do to see that, that, that these people weren't forgiven of their sin. Yes, he preached a good sermon to Nineveh, but his heart of service wasn't for God's glory, or so he would stop suffering. He had hated in his far heart for people who didn't know God because he was convinced that he knew God, the God of Israel. But family, if you have hate in your heart for people, if you love some people and don't love others, if I'll say it, if you have racism in your heart, and that's what we're talking about here with Jonah. He hated a different group of people from a different country just because they were from a different country. If we have hate in our heart and believe that some people deserve God's grace and some people don't, then we're actually a lot more like Jonah than we are like Jesus. If we have hate in our heart for people, I must tell you, we might not know God very personally. For Jesus summed up the moral law of God that we're all accountable to when he said, look, I'll break it down for you real simple. Here's your job. Love God and love people. You can't do one without doing the other. And so this book needs to take us to a place where we get authentic with God and ask God to help us recognize any, any partial love that we have in our heart and, and help us recognize any anger that we have in our heart for people who are not like us. This book of Jonah needs to take us to a place where we submit to God and deal with whatever is in us that resembles more of Jonah and not of Jesus. This is something that we can do. This is something that through all the challenges the church is having in America today that we forget about. Because the truth is, if we want to live for Jesus, we must love people like Jesus. And so this is how I'll leave you. There was a theologian that lived about 100 years ago, and he did this extensive study, this comprehensive study and he wrote an essay called The Emotional Life of Our Lord and where he recorded every instance in the Bible that, re- that described some type of emotion that Jesus had. And what he found out was that the, 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 the most 
typical emotion, the emotion that keep coming up in all the texts that referred to Jesus' emotional life was that Jesus, above all, was described to be full of compassion. With numerous verses in the Bible saying something like, like he, meaning Jesus, was moved with compassion. And if you were to study this word compassion, you would find out that compassion means to be moved in the, the depths of your being, to literally have the inside of your bowels turn inside of you because of the pain that you feel for other people suffering. And, and this theologian found that even though Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit's joy, the Bible records that compassion that led Jesus to grief for other people's pain was, was expressed more than anything in the Bible. The pain of the fatherlessness moved Jesus to compassion. The, the, the pain of broken families moved Jesus to compassion. The pain of loneliness of other people moved him to compassion. The discouraged people moved Jesus to compassion. And so this compassion moved Jesus to action. Now the hate in Jonah's heart moved him to action too. But the Bible says in verse 5 that, that the hate in, in Jonah's heart moved him to go outside the city, hopefully to watch it burn. But Hebrew 13 tells us that Jesus, in fact, was so compassionate, that Jesus had so much compassion for people that he too went outside of the city, the holy city of Jerusalem, not to watch uh, people burn and in judgment, but Jesus went outside the holy city of Jerusalem filled with compassion for sinful people, that ever, all the sinful people that ever lived. And Jesus went outside of the city to die. To die for sinners like you and I. Jonah went outside of the city with hate in his heart, but Jesus went outside of the city filled with compassion. And Jesus climbed Calvary's hill, did he not? Jesus went outside the city, but he didn't want to see anyone burn. And so he climbed Calvary's hill and he became the sacrifice that we need. Jesus went outside the city and hung on a cross for six hours. Until the sun refused to shine, Jesus went outside of the city and hopped up on the cross and bled for six hours until the earth shook, until the curtain in the temple was torn from the bottom to the top, recognized, uh, symbolizing that we can now have access to the blood of Christ. Jesus went outside the city to die for our sins, and Jesus died, and Jesus died, and he was buried, and, and like Jonah was buried in the depths of the sea inside the fish's stomach for three days and three nights, Jesus Christ was buried as well. He was buried in a rich man's tomb, and his body spent three nights in a borrowed tomb in a grave. But the Bible says that his spirit visited Sheol, the abode of the dead, the same place that Jonah referred to while he was in his atmosphere of death. The difference is the greater Jonah, Jesus Christ, didn't preach condemnation. The greater Jonah, Jesus Christ, preach victory because on the cross Jesus won our victory and because Jesus was obedient not like Jonah but because Jesus was obedient even to the point of death even death on the cross God the Father highly exalted him and in his, because of his resurrection and in his resurrection God the Father bestowed on him the name that is above every name so at the knee, name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven on earth and under the earth brothers and sisters as I close this series I must remind you that one day, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? Because his compassion led him to the cross. And now there is no debate on who the real king is. And so I invite you to accept the grace and the mercy of God that led him, his son to the cross. Don't have spiritual amnesia and forget about the greatest story that was ever told, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I invite you, if you have been convicted, don't get mad at me, but deal with it at the altar.
If you sense any type of hate in your heart or any type of self-righteousness in your heart, run fast to the altar. Not saying physically, but if you want to do that, do that. But run to the altar and let God deal with it. Let God rip it out of you. We don't want to suffer from spiritual amnesia. Our mission is too great. Souls are too precious. If you've never accepted Christ, then this is the time to do that. Jesus died for your sins and my sins. All he's asking is that you place your faith in him, that you rely on him, that you repent of sin. Don't be like Jonah, but be like Jesus. Amen? Let us close. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. As your word is a mirror that points out every blemish in us, and we all have them. Father, we thank you for your grace that gives us life when we actually deserve judgment. Help us to not forget our mission, to not forget that it could have been us, yet you chose to save us. Help that truth fill our hearts with compassion for people and that we would go out and we would live by grace and give people grace and love people the way that you love them. We can't be perfect, but Father, help us be better. Help us be better. Thank you for this, this church and the mission that you have given us. Hope I can speak for everyone, but we so desperately want to fulfill the mission you gave us. We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servants. Father, we pray for the seeds of truth that has been preached and planted through the book of Jonah. I pray that those seeds would take root and grow. Father, we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.